content with being, um, you know, sort of um, just uh, folks who who watched and observed and didn't intervene. And I think that I think the time is over for that now. Um, it has to be because uh, we on a nightly basis have to incur the effects of what is quite frankly a, a broken healthcare system. Um, and also, um, you know, a, a, a overall a, a policy landscape that does not serve our most vulnerable. Um, and right now there's a lot of talk, a lot of talk about the social determinants of health and about health inequities and addressing healthcare disparities. We're done talking now. We got to get to work, um, and we've got to start putting together some concrete uh, initiatives, uh, concrete proposals, um, and that can only be done with, uh, you know, physician leadership and and healthcare providers at the table. Uh, we can't do it alone. We can't fix the problems uh, in this country alone. But without us, it cannot be done. We cannot do it alone, but without us, it cannot be done. Uh, so, you know, thank you for inviting me. What I'm going to do is uh, is present a couple things, and that is just um, kind of the 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 why first around why physicians and healthcare providers should care about um, civic engagement and and voter registration in our patients and helping our patients vote. Um, and then what I'd like to do is uh, is is just kind of stop talking and listen to you all and, and hear what your reflections are and uh you know see if there are, if there are parallels that could be drawn between sort of the story that i'm gonna tell you and what you all are doing you know on carbon pricing what you're doing with climate change policy more broadly um and and see if there are ways to intersect so um i just uh i just asked for screen sharing Religion. you need to be able to share uh can you make i yeah. got it just did it right thank that's you that's terrific thanks all right but first uh lisa may not have shared this but uh we're gonna start with a pop quiz <laughs> Woo! back on the wards here we go you guys ready little pop quiz time. All right, pop quiz. This is two part pop quiz. All I want you to do is I want you to put in the chat, not the answers, but just zero to four in terms of how many of these questions you feel like you, you, you could get right. Okay. Zero to four. If you get all, if you feel like you get all four, right, then just put a number four in there. If it's a zero, put a zero in there. Okay. All right, here we go. And for the folks who are not able to see the screen, I will read them out. Question number one, what is a Republican form of government? Ooh. All right, don't have, to, don't have to give me the answer. I just want you to be thinking, can I get this question right? Question number two, what are the three, what are the names of the three branches of the US government? Question number three, in what state senatorial district do you live and what are the names of the counties in such district? Question four, what is the name of the state judicial circuit in which you live? And what are the names of the county or counties in such a district? Again, the ask here is just put in the chat how many you think you could get right. So, you know, can you get five? I'm sorry, can you get four? Can you get zero? Okay, we're seeing a couple twos. Uh, Robin coming strong with, the, with a three. All right, okay. Larry got a three, fantastic. Cynthia Mahoney, how do you get 1.5? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's pretty good. All right. So remember, I said it's gonna be a two-part quiz. All right. So 3.7. Okay. There you go, Rob. Um, so next part of the quiz. Wait. Yeah. I think I overinflated myself. <laughs> That's okay. You get another shot right now. All right, here we go. Part two. Again, for the folks who can't see the screen, I'll read it out. Question one. If a person charged with treason denies his guilt, 
how many persons must testify against him before he can be convicted? Question two, at what time of day on January 20th, each four years, does the term of the president of the United States end? Question three, if the president does not wish to sign a bill, how many days is he allowed in which to return to Congress for reconsideration? And lastly, if a bill is passed by Congress and the president <laughs> refuses to sign it and does not send it back to Congress in session within the specified period of time, is the bill defeated or does it become law? Again, don't, don't need the answers, just need you to tell me, can I get zero of these correct? Can I get four of these correct? One? Okay, we've got some zeros on there. <laughs> a couple of twos. Okay, Pat coming through with the zero. There we go. All right. All right. So. I have a question. Uh, does number one, does that, does that vary in terms of race and socioeconomic level or does it apply to everyone equally? Uh, are you talking about the, the treason question? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. Let's hold it for right for right now, because you're going to see what's going to happen next. Okay. All right. So, uh, you just took a two part quiz, right? But you didn't take, uh, a government, an AP government, uh, exam. You didn't take, uh, you know, a honors graduate level uh, midterm in uh, domestic policy. What you took were the first four questions of a Georgia literacy test in 1962. In order for you to have voted in the state of Georgia in 1962, wow. you would have had to have gotten one hundred percent of those questions wow. right oh. the second some people thought that may you know could do worse on the second one some zeros in the second one well i think you're right uh that one was like objectively harder that was the alabama literacy test some of your lifetimes 1963 if you were in the state of alabama and you wanted to vote you'd have to get one hundred percent of these questions correct okay so um who can vote in this country and under what context has always been contentious and it still is and it still is okay in 2013 thankfully the civil rights act addressed many of the problems that allowed for things like this and this to happen right but in 2013, Shelby versus Holder, unfortunately, gutted the exact provisions that blocked many of these states uh, from enacting restrictive voter laws. And so what you have now, this is back in 2013. So you say, no, 2013 was a long time ago. We're, we're all now in the like Black Lives Matter era and the Me Too era. And, you know, we've just become much more progressive. So we're, we're good now, right? No, we're not. Right. The extension of what happened in 2013 is that now in 2021, we are living through the most unprecedented assault on the ability to vote in this country. Some of this is being talked about, thankfully, but not a lot's being done. So just to calculate this and give you a number, there have been 1,132 restrictive voter laws that have been uh, introduced across the country. Several dozen have already passed. And these are things that like, you know, curtail the ability to uh, vote by mail, for example, or curtail the ability to, um, you know, give people water when they're waiting in a line um, for four or five hours. Uh, or, you know, for example, some counties in Texas now are limiting uh, how many actual voting locations can exist in a county legally. So that a rural county that only has 20,000 people has the same amount of voting locations as a really metropolitan city that has, you know, 200,000 people. So when we come back to why are we doing this, right? We've got to keep this in mind, 
as I mentioned, who can vote in this country and under what circumstances they can vote has always been contentious. So you might ask yourself, so what, right? Some people are gonna say, so what, it doesn't matter. Why should, why should we care about this? Uh, well, we should care because again, there's so much talk about this concept of the social determinants of health. Man, how many grants are being written by individuals, you know, trying to, uh, you know, create interventions about um, addressing the social terms of health. The argument, though, is that if all you ever do is address the social terms of health, which just outline are the underlying community wide social, economic and physical conditions that impact our patients, right? Patient like for me just yesterday, I had an overnight shift. OK, um, I would say that probably 30 to 40 percent of the people that I saw in the ER last night did not need to be in the emergency room. They had no emergency. They were there because it was 2 a.m. They had nowhere else to go uh, or they were hungry. They had abdominal pain because they're starving uh, or they need a work note. Right. So the social terms of health impact our patients. How? Well, if you don't have a place to live, you're going to come into the hospital uh, and you're going to want to get shelter. And what we're going to see in the ER is something called the health related social needs. So these social terms of health impact the chief complaints that we see in the hospital that you see in your clinics that, that we see in our community health centers. Um, and so the argument is if all we ever do is address the social terms of health, what we will end up doing is just playing whack-a-mole with these conditions, right? And addressing them one by one and not actually trying to address the upstream causes. So what are the upstream causes? The structural determinants of health. They're the causes of the causes of poor health, right? They're the policies, the laws, the socioeconomic context, the political context that allow for someone to be homeless in the first place, right? That allow for someone to have inadequate access to food in the first place. If you do not take away anything else from this talk, I want you to take this part. The way you address the structural terms of health, the easiest way is by helping people vote. We have a country, unfortunately, where 50 million people are just not part of the process. That's a whole country's worth of people that are not participating in the political process. And unfortunately, those 50 million end up being the same exact folks who get shafted by our health system, right? Um, who uh, uh, take it on the chin with regard to, um, you know, perturbations in climate change, uh, who, you know, are showing up first uh, when, when uh, you know, the sea levels rise and there's flooding. They're the ones who've got to move, but they've got no house on the Cape, right? They've got no other, um, establishment they've got to they've got to you know wake up uh get over to i don't know if it's kroger's or trader joe's or whole foods whatever you guys got out there uh to make sure they're bagging groceries so they're going to feel the effects of this first so we need to make sure that they have a seat at the table to help us create the policies that uh make up you know the the country that we live in and so when we look at the demographics the folks who tend to be uh, most marginalized of our healthcare system uh, and the folks who are unregistered but eligible voters <clears throat> tend to be younger, tend to be poor, and they tend to more likely to not be people of color, right? So it's this demographic overlap that animates the why behind why physicians and healthcare providers should get involved. So that's all theoretical, right? We're, we're talking very theoretical, but let's get, let's get concrete for a second. Um, the bottom line is, and for many of you who've already worked on campaigns, you know, maybe helping someone run for Congress or for Senate, or maybe you've, you've worked on a presidential, you know that when you log into VAN, the Voter Access Network, which is, you know, the, the computer system that we use to figure out whose door to knock on, who to call, who to text, et cetera. Unfortunately, there are really important algorithms that are at play there that literally remove people who are not voters. <clears throat> They just remove them. They don't exist. They're invisible. They do not exist because, you know, campaigns make calculations that say uh, we only have X number of dollars and X number of hours in a day. Let's not deploy them to people who don't vote. Why is that a problem? Because if they don't vote, then cam if campaigns don't make contact and those, you know, folks who are running for office, if they become electeds, 
they have not been in any way, shape or form listening to the perspectives of the communities that are most in need, right? And so by simply by getting people, I'm just saying, just on the rolls, even if they don't vote, um, you know, my argument is um, it's better for them to be uh, registered and not voting because at least they'll show up on van um, than to be unregistered and not voting. So the first step is just getting them registered to vote, getting them on the list. <clears throat> and so again, um, just making this more concrete, we've done this. We've done this um, this analysis across uh, almost every major metropolitan city and found the same exact um, correlation. Again, correlation is not a causation. We can't we can't argue that yet. But but you already know where I'm going with this. Um, this is from last cycle's uh, mayoral race in New York City. Uh, this precinct in East Harlem had a 35 percent lower voter turnout rate compared to citywide turnout in that 2018 election. Right. That same part of East Harlem maps onto a census tract. Just that <laughs> census tract alone has a nearly 20 year life expectancy difference, lower life expectancy difference, right? So what we're finding is where voting and civic engagement behavior is lower, health outcomes are also worse. Uh, but if you don't buy it in, in New York, let's go to Detroit. Um, and we'll make it even more real here. So this is a this is a corner of Detroit called Southwest Detroit. It's got 24 industrial sites. It's got scrap yards, oil storage plants, oil refineries. From a climate change perspective, and from an environmental health perspective, what do you think it's like to live in these homes over here, with all of those pollutants in the air, right? making it really, really difficult for people to raise their kids, go out and walk their dog, live a life. And so what we see is the health outcomes in this part of South, Southwest Detroit are disproportionately worse than the rest of the city. They live seven years less in the U.S. as a whole. Their asthma and hospitalization rates are much higher. And so quick poll, right? So just to make sure that folks are, are, are uh, or tracking this, and I'm sure you are, but do you think that part of Southwest Detroit has a higher or a lower civic participation uh, rate than other parts? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs down. Yeah. So you're right. So this, uh, this uh, was a study that was done by folks at University of Michigan. Bottom line is um, they looked at all 4,800 election precincts, and long story short, they found that the top 19 least engaged precincts are in Southwest Detroit. All right, so now, and this is this is something I just, you know, I just had an experience recently. I think, I think you all have had these experiences as well. I had a patient who came in with, uh, with an asthma exacerbation. This is maybe about two or three months ago now. And um, she was, you know, maybe 20 or something like that, 19 or 20 years old. And, you know, she saw my lanyard. We're going we're gonna to talk about this in a sec. But basically, she saw the, my lanyard. She said, ready to vote. What is that? Like, why, why does that say vote on it? I said, well, it says vote on it because, you know, it's really important that you, you know, take 30 seconds, just check to make sure you're registered to vote or, or register yourself. It'll take you a minute. The platform will walk you through all the steps. I have to go see another patient. But if you have any questions, all you got to do is, call the number on that site and they'll walk you through the rest 24 7. she says i'm good i don't really vote i'm not really about that i'm like oh okay tell me about it she's like oh well voting like i don't know it's like what does it change you know i said okay you see how you have asthma right and she's like uh she's like yeah and i say well you see how i'm writing you for prescription for albuterol she says yeah so, well, you have asthma, just like everybody else in your neighborhood. Because where you live is the exact same place where the chemical plants are and the oil plants are and the pollutants are. And guess what? Those chemical plants and oil plants, they had to go somewhere. They had to go somewhere in the city of Boston. Guess where they went? Your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you ain't voting. Don't tell me it doesn't matter. You know, like in the hospital, I said, you know, I can take care of you. I can make sure that you do well. I can, you know, 
But after you leave here, it's up to you. And you've got to, this is one of the most important things you can do to make sure that your community is healthier, you know? So, um, you know, back to, back to what I was saying about, you know, this new interest in addressing racial health equity. Um, you know, if we're really serious about addressing racial and social inequities uh, in healthcare, we need concrete actions, right? We don't need optical or performative solutions. And with no offense to anybody who's part of the AMA, because this might be good, but we'll see. Um, you know, recently the AMA recognized racism as a public health threat. Great. Yeah. However, uh, we need to distinguish what is just optical allyship, like what is done for the optics and what is actually making a difference, right? What is optical allyship? Optical allyship is defined as allyship that only serves at the surface level to platform the ally. It makes a statement, but doesn't go beneath the surface and is not aimed at breaking away from the systems of power that, that oppress. If you're seriously interested in, in, in disrupting the systems of power that oppress, it starts with empowering people right? Like it starts with literally giving, you know, giving people a seat at the table and, and having them step into the power that they already have, you know? Um, and it's not just, it's not just me and the, you know, thousands of physicians that are doing this voter registration work in their, in their day to day to get this, even the national academies of science, engineering, and medicine already understand this. Um, you know, they just, in the 2019, um, consensus report, this is the whole report was on social terms of health, basically. Um, and they argue that it's the time for awareness is over. We can't do awareness anymore. Like done with, with awareness of, you know, uh, inequity. Let's be done with awareness in, uh, of the impact of racism. Let's be done with the impact of awareness on uh, gender disparity. Um, it's time to do something about these things. Like, and moving from what they call awareness to, through the five A's framework to advocacy is where they are, um, they are compelling hospitals and, and clinicians to go to. And so wh why does voting help? So we as healthcare providers, if we help our patients get registered to vote, which is totally legal, first of all, oh. and totally encouraged because of the 1993 National Voter Registration Act, which not only legalized, but encouraged hospitals to do voter registration. When we help our patients vote, they they actually do vote, right? Then they become labeled as likely voters. And then let's go back to that person who's running for mayor or congressman or senator. They now have to grapple with, hey, what is this constituency who votes? What do they think? Is it okay that in East Boston, where this young woman is from, uh, is it okay that uh, a disproportionate uh, number of people in this neighborhood have asthma because of the oil the oil plants in this neighborhood like now I have to grapple with this because these this is a voting constituency and so um, at the end of the day um, this is 100 percent within our right to help our patients vote and also let me just say one thing this is not a talk about physician advocacy that's a completely or physician civic engagement I have a different talk on that but let me just bring this one fact in um, and the reason why I didn't make that the priority of this talk is because I feel like this is not a problem for this group, but physicians vote at lower rates than the average population. They vote at 10 to 15% lower rates. And they have been, unfortunately, for the last two or three decades. So why, why is that? It's a good question. I mean, I don't think that there are any clear um, answers, but I can speculate that, you know, physicians feel like they've already done a duty. You know, they've already sort of done their part um and so like why should i have to like take time out of my day and go and vote um i think that's part of it. i think the other part is they work they actually do work a lot we work a lot and we're busy and we're tired and this is like another thing another ask we have to be mindful of so and also in the last thing i you know i said at the beginning there was a time where physicians were just on the sidelines and didn't they were above you know, they're above politics, right? Like we're too good. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be getting involved with all that stuff. So I think that, I think that there's a confluence of different factors, you know? Interesting. So that's all the why, oh, Lisa, were you gonna say something? No, go ahead. I oh. wouldn't. Do you, Alice, do you yeah. have any idea of the physicians who don't vote? Are there any uniting, 
uniting characteristics of that non-voting physician group that you're aware of? Yeah, great question. Um, we don't have any data on that yet. I mean, this whole thing is so new, right? Like health in voting, uh, you know, physician civic engagement. This was all so new. And we, we, we really have so much to study to sort of figure this out and get this, get this, uh, you know, field really explored. And obviously I invite anyone who's interested um, in doing that exploration to, to be part of our, you know, we've got a research team that's beginning to sort of ask some of these questions, um, but also encourage your own research explorations too. Uh, Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of room here. Uh, Lee. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I gave an advocacy talk uh, to a group of public health students a couple of years ago, and I would say that 60 or 70 percent of them uh, just said, I'm not going to vote. I don't believe voting changes anything. It was really frightening. Yeah. And these were, you know, young, young health professional students. Yeah. Yeah, it's really it's really sad. And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of. Um, you know, there's two different kinds. There's the apathetic, you know, there's the like, I just don't care about this. I'm not interested. Like, it's not going to change anything. And then there's the like, the, 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 like the woke warrior, you know what I mean? Who's like, I'm, I'm so beyond right. the system that I, I will only protest and wildcat strike and, you know, enforce a picket line. And like the voting is like beneath me and, and they don't see how there's, you can do both. I mean, there's, you know, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can protest and you can also vote because, you know, the, these are not, these are not mutually exclusive. So I know, I, Lee, I think that that's, uh, that's exactly what I've seen as well. But my experience as well. Um, wow. That's uh, and very moving and very sad in a lot of ways. Um, I have some questions, but I'm sure that there are others on the call who have lots of questions. Um, we have one group who, who you may be familiar with, Climate Health Now out of California. Mm -hmm. um, several of them are also CCLers and are here now. And they um, have been doing quite a bit of work as well in this intersection between voting and health. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, do you wanna talk about that at all or Margaret? Or did you have specific questions you'd like to raise? Yes, will you talk to our group? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell Alistair a little bit about, or Alistair, are you already familiar with the work that they're doing? Um, I, I think I've heard of, I think I've heard of the group and I think we may have been in contact in the past, but I don't think we've had any like formal um, collaborations yet. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you a very little Alistair. Okay. So, uh, Climate Health Now is a group of 500 health professionals across California who are working to organize and mobilize the health voice, uh, primarily initially around climate, but we've recognized starting last, well, we formed in late 2019. Uh, last year, we did a lot of work around healthy voting, making sure that people could stay mm -hmm. healthy while voting in the COVID pandemic. Um, and then that also um, led to uh, a campaign called the Dear Patient Letter where we were uh, trying to get out the word to our patients that they need to elect people who will act on climate, that that's very important for their health. And we, we're a 501c4 as well as a 501c3. So we've decided that we would not Add, that we would not endorse specific candidates, but that we would educate our patients about what's important for their health and what to look for. And we do advocate for specific policies, for example, setbacks from oil and gas drilling in California. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we are doing a campaign called Healing Democracy. The health of humanity depends on healing democracy. I'd love to tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, and we are in touch with uh, Dana, yep. I think that was yep. her name, right? Yeah, uh, we've yep. been in touch with her and uh, are are planning to get more involved with the vote ER. So okay. we did Sweet. get into the August Civic Health Month, and our that was our our action <laughs> was what we were yep. already doing. Uh, but we'd like to 
get to the next step. Last year, we were kind of behind the eight ball. By the time we started with the registration, it was already you know, August, September, but mm -hmm. now we want to get started with that in the next couple of months and, and really work on this and get out that message um, and make physicians more comfortable advocating. Because I think that, that what you talked about in terms of not that we're better than this, but we're uncomfortable. We don't want to alienate people. Mm. We don't want to be seen as partisan. Yeah. And so a lot of the message that we try to get out is that physicians must be involved in policy. That's what politics is, but we can stay nonpartisan. Yeah. Um, and so there's just so much work to be done and I'm, I'm thrilled with um, everything you're doing. Uh, it's, it's really inspiring and I hope we can do more work together. Yeah. Uh, Margie, did you want to add something? Margie's my co-lead on the voting. Right. We have voting for climate and health is one of our action teams for climate health now. I, we weren't expecting to have a voting team, but hey, that's where the need is, right? Right. right. So we, we hope to launch, um, uh, we, we're busy with our, our, our letters to senators and doing videos to, 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 to push the senators to consider modifying the filibuster and supporting the we're going to You're a little hard to hear margaret margie do a vote er we're going to de definitely launch the voter er um uh, campaign with our 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 constituents our doctors and health care providers and and teach them how to do that um, okay great October. so maybe we can keep in touch <laughs> yes i'd love that just to catch uh, everyone up to speak as some folks have already some some folks already have have these and also some folks probably have never seen seen any of this before so let me just uh let me just spend a couple more minutes giving you some concrete as much time as you'd like that would be very helpful thank you yeah just some concrete details on you understand the why and the sort of the theoretical but then but then we have to also be deeply practical and pragmatic and figure out how to like just get started right and, mm -hmm. and get going we can't opine about this for the, for the rest of our lives so um, what we do is we have created basically three different interventions that we um, deploy for hospitals, clinics, physicians, et cetera. All of them are free, um, including these kits, which you can order yourself. And I'll, I'll drop the link in a second. But the bottom line is the first thing we've created. Oh, there we go, Margie. Uh, is uh, we, we've created these healthy democracy kits, which um, you know, a physician or a nurse or a social worker puts their information in. We send them a box about three to four weeks and um, it's got this lanyard it has a badge backer in it and all that can be used to help someone register to vote we have about twenty four thousand people that are using these kits throughout the country um, and what this really allows for and we'll get to organizing in, in a bit but this allows us to have a base from which to begin organizing and a base from which to begin sort of um, activating people within their own hospitals and clinic settings to institutionalize this work at their at their workplace setting um yeah go ahead lisa it says attending doctor but i assume that any health professional could can get a lanyard similar to yeah. this yeah okay. yeah the second are these site-based uh, materials that we created basically these are posters and discharge paperwork that uh, we ship to a hospital or health center for free they put the posters up uh they allow people to register to vote while they're in the waiting room or in the exam room they all have a text code um, and we have about 700 hospitals and clinics that are using these. And then lastly, we partner with community health centers to send text messages to patients, um, primarily because community health centers serve the, the exact populations that we're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. And also many of them already send text messages to their patients. Um, this is one quick anecdote. Dr. Stager is a pediatrician um, out of Ohio, and um, she uses her kit a very similar way that I use my kit, which is she brings in the voting question in her social history. So she asks her patients, you know, do you smoke? Do you drink? Are you registered to vote? And if people say no, she shows them the QR code. And then she says, you know, uh, if you need any help, there's a hotline on there. They can walk you through all the steps. It takes about a minute to do. Um, this is just a demographic breakdown in the last year and a half um, of the 24,000 folks that we've mobilized. The majority are, are physicians, and that's either residents, fellows, or attendings, and then the remainder are students, nurses, PAs, and social workers. This is a forthcoming research article on this um, on this question that we are very curious about, which is why did why did physicians want to help people vote? And so we asked them, 
and the number one answer was they were trying to address social and racial inequities, which is very interesting. It wasn't, you know, I want to impact the national election. Um, that was certainly part of it, but it wasn't the main driver. Um, Lauren is a patient of Dr. Stager's who we just talked about. She was 19. She had never voted before. Uh, NBC News actually caught an interaction between Dr. Stager and Lauren that turned into Lauren voting or registering to vote for the first time. Not only did that happen, but Lauren then went home and helped her parents and her sisters register to vote. And so we know we've calculated there, there have been about 46,000 people like Lauren who we've engaged through VoteR to either register to vote or get the mail-in ballots. What we don't know is how many of those people then went on and helped others like Lauren did. Or voted. Or, or we have the voted number. Um, I'll share it in, in, in a second. Um, this is the racial and age breakdown. So about 50% of the people that we helped identified as people of color. Um, about 40% were younger than 29, which just suggests that the population we're helping in healthcare settings is a younger population and also more diverse than the average American. Um, I'm gonna skip over this for now. So yeah, so in summary, we helped about 46,000 people um, to vote. Um, about 24,000 of these kits have been shipped out there and then there are hundreds of sites and associations and organizations that are involved. Um, in terms of this number, it turns out that about 70% of the people who we helped complete their voter registration or get their mail ballot actually voted, which is, which is about average. It's not way better, not way worse than the, than the average turnout. Why that is still okay is because many of these people were first time voters. So we're, we're okay with that 70%. Where we're going is we wanna be in every single healthcare setting, clinic, site, helping these sites do nonpartisan voter registration doesn't have to say vote ER. In fact, most of our materials just say the logo of the hospital um, that, that it's deployed at. Um, so how can you guys get, get involved? Number one, you know, again, I think you all are probably okay, but if, but if not, you know, take a second, check your own voter registration, make sure you're registered to vote. Number two, you can get one of those kits. I'll drop this link in the chat. Um, but basically these kits are free and they will, always, they will always be free. And so like Margie, you can get your own kit and you can register you know, your patients to vote um, or, or your colleagues or your, your sons and daughters or your family members, like anybody, you know? So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a sort of shifting of responsibility to make sure our fellow Americans can, um, can, can do this very important thing, which is being part of the political process. And then lastly, August is National Civic Health Month which we are in August. Um, and what that is, is a, is, a, is a convening of hospitals and clinics and organizations throughout the country. There are about 245 so far that all choose to do one thing in the month of August to help people vote. So some of them put on a webinar, some of them like the CEO of the hospital, for example, uh, several hospitals all throughout the country, um, send out an email that said from the CEO that says, I think it's important for you to check your registration. Here's a link, it'll take 30 seconds. You know, and that's one of the most powerful interventions actually. Um, or we have national organizations like the AAP or um, SNMA or some of the, or some of the hospital associations, um, you know, put out, you know, interventions that are, that are geared towards making sure the membership can vote. Um, the last thing I'll say, because I think you guys would, 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 would appreciate this, and, and that is, you know, whether you're building power around, um, you know, police reform, or you're building power around um, racial equity, or building power around climate change, I think this model, this slide is an incredibly important slide, right? So when I first started, I, I would have told you that, that what I was trying to do was this, you know, before the election, we dramatically increase the number of people that are involved We put them to work. And then when the election's over, we kind of like hit reset. And then we got to kind of start over again, right? Because this is why, this is what, this is what campaigns do. This is what presidential elections do. This is what, what mayoral elections, senatorial, that's not what we need to be doing, right? We need to be building sustained power. We're not running for office. We're building sustained power and building sustained power means you've got to mobilize people. By the way, not just during elections, they're going to be flashpoints. There's going to be some 
awful climate emergency that will happen that will you know hold the nation's attention for two or three days that's a mobilization point right build the numbers very quickly then don't let go of them organize them teach them build them right build their skills right so it's this constant cycle i'm learning now building your list and then building your people right and the building your list is the mobilizing and building people is the organizing work so to that end, we've started a civic health fellowship, which is a 10 month long community organizing training program. And we, we train physicians uh, to be community organizers. And it's a 10 month long thing. It's really, 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 I'm so blown away by how these folks have grown. Um, and the majority of them are from these important battleground states. And they are gonna be the people who in the 2022 cycle are gonna be the ones who are activating their networks and really beginning to kind of do the the relational work in a way that we could never because we're not from those communities, you know. So that's all I got. Um, I hope that was helpful. That was really, really wonderful, Alistair. Um, and real quick, any of those fellows from Michigan just out of curiosity? Oh yeah, we got a lot of fellows from Michigan. I'll drop the chat. I'll drop a link in the chat that shows. Yeah, I should connect with them. Uh, Bob, you had a, a question. Yeah. Alistair, I think I heard you say partway through your presentation that something about there was legislation or something that encouraged or made hospital systems or something have a role in voter registration. I didn't quite absorb all that. Yes, yes, yes. So um, this is the, I don't know how, how, how uh, deep you all want to go in this, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the primer. Um, this is an article that we wrote just kind of outlining a bit of what, what, uh, what, I, what I just mentioned, but the, the quick story is, is this, um, the national voter registration act of 1993 was passed during the Clinton administration's first year. And it was done so to expand, um, voter access in this country. And so it incur it legalized voter registration in healthcare settings. First of all, anywhere where Medicare or Medicaid is, is um, provided or um, uh, Medicare, Medicare patients are served, uh, you are not only um, in, uh, legal, legally allowed to, but encouraged to do voter registration. Um, and then it, it also did the same thing across WIC agencies, unemployment agencies, and all types of sort of federally, uh, you know, funded, um, you know, places that, that provide service to low-income communities. The problem is it didn't mandate it. It only mandated it in one place. Does anybody know the one place where it's mandated from the 1993 National Voter Registration Act? VA. Good. That's a good guess. It's the DMV. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell does voting have to do with driving? You would you you could argue that like being in a healthcare facility is more you know aligned with anyway. So I, I actually found the woman who helped to pass that that legislation. This wonderful wonderful woman. She's my hero, man. Her name is uh, Frances Fox Piven. I don't know if anybody knows who that is on the line, but she's just wonderful. She's like 89 years old now, and uh, you know I tried to get a Zoom. I tried to get a, get her on Zoom like two months ago didn't work. So she, she's the kind of woman you just got to like call. She says, just call me sometime next week before 8 a.m. So I called her and I said, Francis, uh, you know, you've done such great work with this National Voter Registration Act. It's the whole reason why we can do this work with ODR. And I said, but I have a question for you. Why, <laughs> why did you choose DMVs <laughs> as the one place to mandate voter registration? Like, you know, poor people don't drive. So like, it, it doesn't seem like it would be a good idea to do that. She said, Alistair, it was a negotiation. Of course, we wanted healthcare to be the place where people were mandated to do voter registration. Mm. But the opposition was not interested in that. And the only place they would allow us to, to mandate voter registration was places like, you know, where basically where, where, where people who are uh, the kinds of folks we're trying to help don't vote, you know, they don't show up. So. Wow. So that's the background. Yeah. I guess I was smart. curious if you people talked to large healthcare systems, hospital systems, and gone discussed the Voter Act, and not that they're mandated, but they're encouraged to do it. Is, is has that happened? Is that ever a selling point? 
you ever see a big system say, yeah, it's a good idea. We should take that responsibility. It's just too much hassle for them. Yeah, no, we've had, you know, we've had, you know, over, we have over 700 clinics and hospitals that do it that have posters and discharge paperwork. Um, <laughs> and, you know, about 240 of them have signed on to something called to, to Civic Health Month, which we talked about. Um, and that, a lot of that has happened since the pandemic, during yeah. the pandemic. I think it's quite frankly, it's not in spite of it's because of the pandemic, you know, mm. uh, I think that this was a, a, this was a flashpoint. And of course, there are still partisans, right? There are still people who are not interested in this. They don't want to have people voting. So those folks, you just have to say, uh, great, uh, we're going to go ahead and mobilize every other hospital in your city to do voter registration. And then we're going to ask a question at the end of that, which is how come the other five hospitals in your city are doing voter registration and your and yours is not. Um, and and so like that that that's that is the that is the approach that we use, you know, sequencing, basically. Catherine, I think you had a question next. Um, uh, yes, I just I'm embarrassed to tell you that I had no idea it was legal to register people in hospitals, and so now yeah. I'm wondering. Are there any public places where it is not legal to register somebody to vote? Hmm. Now that is a really good question. Um, yeah. So there. So here's here's two answers to that. Um, some states have made it very very hard to register someone to vote. For example, in the state of Texas, if you register someone to vote and you are not um, uh, designated as a registrar by the county that that person's registering, you get fined. It's a misdemeanor. And if you do it a couple times, you go to jail. Wow. Um, so number one in Texas, you can it's like very hard to register some register someone to vote. You have to go to the county clerk and say, I want to be a voter registrar for people in this specific county. Can you please allow me? like that's, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, the second answer to that question is, um, uh, there is there is a provision that basically allows um, health centers that get federal funding to do voter registration, and it, and it encourages it, just like everybody every, every every other hospital, right? Just like any other nonprofit. However, if that community health center, for example, uses the money from federal funding to register people to vote, that's a no-no. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that's another weird law. So for example, if a, if a, if a community health center gets a big grant, $500,000 grant for COVID, they can't then just turn around and take that $500,000 grant and register a bunch of people to vote. Hmm. And I think that, I think the, I think the reason why is because they, you know, they're concerned that the administration that is giving the federal funding may be doing so with the idea that they would register people to vote for them or something like that. So I should find out what's legal in my city, but generally, can I register people in public parks, in of libraries, course. in- Oh my God, yeah, yeah, of course. Women's restrooms, um, <laughs> in swimming pools. I mean, um, Just not the men's restrooms. <laughs> Catherine, what state are you in? That's the next thing I'll work on. <laughs> I think you'd okay. have to be, I think you'd have to be careful if it's a mall that is privately owned. Oh. Um, so, um, that may be considered private property. We're down to four minutes, guys. So we want to be respectful of Alistair's time. Um, uh, Cynthia put, is this your question? Yes. Is this what you want to ask? What's the best okay. way to get hospitals on board? Is there pushback from hospitals if physicians show up with a lanyard? Do they need permission? And is I would add to that, is that why it's more doctors than it is nurses or other people? Mm, Are they frightened it. that they'll get pushback? Yeah, that's a very good question. Sorry, did you want to expand on that, Cynthia? Uh, no, that's that was exactly it. Okay, so yeah, so um, you nailed it. So here's here's the whole secret here, right? The whole secret is, if you were me three years ago and you wanted to build out this concept of civic engagement in healthcare settings, you wouldn't start by asking hospital leadership to do voter registration at triage. Right. <laughs> right. You wouldn't you wouldn't start with some, you know, like deeply disrupt, you know, like you'd have to make it really easy for them. 
Um, and so, so we made it really easy for Mass General, the hospital that I work at, to begin doing this. Um, and we got them lots of publicity and press. So they were very excited about that. It also was helpful for donations and fundraising, right? So now we're speaking in a language of, our, of, of you know, folks' interests, right? Now, um, I can't do that everywhere. I can't do that in, in all the hospitals because I don't know anywhere near enough to be effective like that. So, but what can I do? We can mobilize physicians at those hospitals and have them do it, right? Have them be the ones that put pressure on their hospitals. Why? Because it's really hard for um, administration, the administration of a hospital to, to say to a physician, no, you can't. Can you imagine what it's like the other side of that argument? The physician is trying to register someone to vote. It's legal. It's encouraged. The law says it's okay to do it. And the, the other side of the argument, the administrator is saying, no, physician, you can't help someone, uh, you know, uh, do this constitutional, um, you know, this, this, this privilege that, they, that we all have, this right that we all have um, during a pandemic. <laughs> Just brilliant. It's just brilliant. A pandemic. It really is. So really really is. I, I guess, Alistair, part of my question is, is it best to just start doing it and then show administration after you've done it for a few weeks, show this to the administration and bring it up? Or is it better to start saying, hey, I want to do this. This is going to happen. We hope you'll do it, but let's you can see what I'm doing. Like uh, how, yeah, how do you question. get people on board? Well, first of all, this is always, listen, this is just your person. You can, you can wear whatever kind of lanyard. I'm assuming you can wear whatever kind of lanyard you want at your hospital. You can put whatever kind of badge you want on your, on your, on your ID. So that's the first thing. So for your own kit, you can totally feel comfortable putting that on. Um, unless the, the, unless the hospital has said you cannot wear any lanyard that is not our lanyard, which is a really great, uh, screenshot to then send to the reporters in your city that's a great story <laughs> good story love that story so so uh number one you know you can use your own kit you know and just get started that way if you want to institutionalize vodr that's a little bit of a different lift and we've put together a deck that literally walks you through how would you do this <laughs> right um we also and at the end of the deck we have our organizers who literally, like, if you want to spend time talking about how to do this at your hospital, you can book a one-on-one -on -one with our organizers and we'll, it will basically help you walk, walk through it. Does that help? You know, did you pay me to ask this question up front? <laughs> <laughs> the check is in the mail. <laughs> we are at 930. Um, we have two more questions. But, you know, maybe we can shoot them to you where I'm, I think we're all willing to stay on, but you, you were on call all night last night. Yeah, no, I'm, ha I'm, happy, so. I'm happy to take the, the last two questions and, and, and see, you know, what, what folks are thinking. Thank you. Robin, do you want to ask your question? Then we'll go to Curtis. Actually, the content was covered a lot by Cynthia. Okay, great. Then Curtis. Yeah, I just had a quick question have does the league of women voters either at the national level or the state of massachusetts know about your work yes or, and they do yeah they, they they have been they have been incredible partners we put out a press release together about three months ago in the lead up to, to national civic health month and the um the uh president of the league of women voters is on our board okay oh, wow really Yep. That is great. Yeah, it's, it's Deborah Turner, who's a physician. Uh, the president oh, of the didn't know that. is a physician. Yeah, so I didn't know that. So we, we get it. We get each other. Okay, I bet you do. Yep. Curtis, was that your whole question? Or you got more? Well, no, I was just going to make a comment. I, I'm definitely going to figure out whether the Tennessee League, or the Nashville League, or the Williamson County League, which are all part of the the Metro Nashville area, those two places. I. I'm definitely going to figure out whether or not the people even know about this, because I guarantee you that as a physician, this has been a revelation to me. And so thank you. Yeah, of course. You know, one thing I'll say is uh, you got to be careful in Tennessee um, because <laughs> we. Uh, this is Tennessee. No, no. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I uh, no, I, I one of our first hospitals that was very interested in doing this was Vanderbilt. Uh, oh, and well, that's uh, where I that's kind of where I work. So, yeah. 
So they're very interested in, we were working with some physicians in, 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 at Vanderbilt to do this, a, a surgeon and an ER physician to get it institutionalized there. And you know what we ran into is that uh, Tennessee recently passed a law similar to Texas's law, which is that you need to register to be able to register other people to vote. So they, they've, they've erected this other barrier now that blocks you from just getting in there. You know, so one thing I'll say about that and similar with the Texas example, the beauty of this system is that you're not registering anyone to vote, right? Like you're just giving them a QR code for them to register themselves to vote. Nonetheless, it's still kind of, you know, it's a little bit legally tricky um, to have to parse that argument out. And, and uh, we are a nonprofit, a very small nonprofit, and we don't have a huge legal team. So we don't have the, the money to fight these battles. So we're kind of just at this moment, not fighting them. Um, but, but just so you know, so Curtis, so I'd love to, you know, find time to, to help you think through it. Give me a favor. I'm going to put my email in the chat. If you would yep. send me the name of the physicians. Sure. I, I'll do it right now. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Of course. So Alistair, is it okay if I tell them where you're moving? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So Alistair's moving to DC because he's going to be part of the Biden administration. Oh, a big, big you. hand clap. Yeah. And thank I will tell you much. that um, when I talked to Mark about Alistair's work, Mark Reynolds, he was like, oh my God, can we join on to Civic Month? And um, that's our executive director. And oh, wow. um, so I don't know how much time are you going to have you know, to talk to people after you go to DC and do some of, you know, this kind of work because yeah. it is so inspiring, but there's yeah, only so many hours question. in a day. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. So just, just so folks have the background. So it's a, um, it's a position called um, um, the White House Fellowship. So mm -hmm. it's a nonpartisan program, first of all, that, uh, that selects about 15, uh, people a year and puts them in the office of, you know, some secretary, secretary of state, or secretary of defense or something. And so I've been brought on to do voter rights work in promoting voter access. Um, and that's in Kamala Harris's office because uh, Biden, President Biden tasked her with that. So, uh, so unfortunately, what that means is because of conflict of interest laws, I have to step back from VODR. So I'm stepping away as executive director. We're promoting our chief operating officer and I'm just moving to the board. So I'm still involved. I just can't be, I can't be involved in the day-to-day -day as much. Um, and, 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 and everything is still gonna work out just fine. She's been great. You know, she's been with us for about two years. So. Who is that? Well, 